I want to thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for making the time to join our webinar. My name is Doreen Zhao, and I'm in charge of knowledge management and marketing for MSC Anglophone Africa. Now, today we are here to have a very important conversation around financing agribusinesses amid COVID-19. I'm sure you will all agree with me that this global pandemic has had a significant impact on MSMEs, especially regarding access to finance for youth and women-owned agri MSMEs. Now, in light of this, we are here to examine in great detail challenges that MSMEs in the agriculture sector grapple with as they seek finance during the pandemic. And more importantly, we will bring some, some of the ways in which governments, donors, and financial service providers can support these entrepreneurs to build back better. Now, allow me to quickly take you through the agenda for this session. We will kickstart the webinar with real conversations from the ground with representatives from both the demand and supply side who will paint for us a very good picture of the situation on the ground. From there, we'll have a very quick Q&A session after which we'll move into a round of conversations in a panel discussion. Our panelists will be introduced to us at this juncture. Now, after the panel discussion, we'll have another short Q&A session and then we'll bring the session to an end with some closing remarks from Dr. Robert Mwadime, who is USAID KCDMS Chief of Party. Our moderator for our session today is Eric Kingori. Eric is an independent consultant in the finance and investment space. He will be taking over the program once we are done with the introductions. Now, before we kick off, allow me to just have a uh, note a few housekeeping issues. We encourage you to use the chat box function for all your questions and we'll try as much as possible to address all the questions during the Q&A session. Also, kindly to remember to keep your video and microphones off when you're not speaking. Now, let me introduce Dr. Albert Mwadime, USAID KCDMS Chief of Party, to give us some opening remarks. Welcome, Mr. Mwadime. He be a representative from KCDMS, and then he can come and speak after that. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, Doreen, and uh, this is to welcome everybody to this uh, webinar that we will be sharing uh, our experiences and also the market players in the finance uh, sector and also in the agriculture market systems will be sharing their experiences in uh, accessing finance and also their operations the effect of COVID-19 on uh, their businesses. And we hope that after this session, we will have taken lessons. Most importantly, what we will be keen to look at is what was the impact? How did we react and how are our businesses adapting? Because this COVID-19 has been with us for quite some time. And uh, we thought that it would be three months, it is gone, but here it is, two years. Uh, almost two years. So how are our organizations, how are our businesses, private sector and, and even government adapting to enable uh, the private sector to be able to continue doing business and improving the livelihoods of our people. So we are keen to listen to those adaptations and probably just another question uh, we may ask ourselves, where are we headed to if COVID-19 persists, if it comes to an end, what will have changed? and what are the lessons that we can take from this. So we look forward to a very, very uh, interesting uh, discussion and taking the lessons from here. And uh, certainly our uh, chief of party will be able to make uh, some remarks uh, probably towards the end of this uh, webinar. Back to you, Doreen, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Joseph, for that and for standing in for Mr. Mwadime. I'm sure he'll join us shortly and he'll be able to contribute now. Uh, without much further ado, allow me to hand over this uh, session to Eric Kingori, who is our moderator for today. Welcome, Eric. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, really happy to be here and excellent to, to be having this conversation. Um, and, and, and also greatly... Uh, uh, honored to, to moderate this. Uh, my name is Eric Kingori, as you've heard. And uh, by background, I am a banker and have had many years of experience in lending, and uh, especially in agriculture lending, 
So it's a subject that I can talk about for very, very long. And so I'm, I'm happy to, to, to be here. And uh, just as a synopsis of what we are dealing with and talking about today and the background is that uh, I think the statistics are quite clear. They, they do suggest that uh, agriculture has a problem, especially when we come to access to financing. So in my banking days, you know, if you came in with a property financing deal and somebody else came in with an agriculture deal, then uh, the, the property deal tended to get financed better than a, an agriculture finance. So the question then should be exactly what is causing this? What makes an agriculture deal that more difficult to, uh, to fund? Is it, are these real issues that they imagined? And I think that's what this conversation is going to tell us. And that's what we are happy about, that these conversations will be about what has actually happened and because of COVID. And uh, we will look at both the demand side and we have a couple of uh, institutions and companies that deal with this. We'll look at the supply side. So we'll have a couple of uh, finance people who will tell us exactly what their experience is. And so from a point of view of agriculture, you know, in my past life, I had a boss who used to say, if you're in a hole, the very first thing you do is to stop digging. Now, clearly, agriculture is in a hole in as far as access to finance is concerned. So we need to, first of all, identify this digging. What is it? And how can we stop it? And what more can we do to make things better? And for that reason, that's why we are having this conversation. So we'll start with the demand side. And uh, we have uh, quite a good number of uh, panelists uh, here. We have uh, Immaculate Chien, Chieno. We have Dr. Patrick Katondu, we have Daniel Mosioka, Tom Kibet, Nehemiah Odongo, and Vivian Okondo. So I think I will give each of these uh, panelists, starting with uh, Immaculate, uh, one minute to introduce themselves, uh, say who they are, before we then start tackling the question. So Immaculate. Maybe you can give us a minute of, uh, or 30 seconds of who you are, what you do, and who you represent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Eric. So my name is Immaculate Ocieno. I'm the lending manager for East Africa for Shared Interest Society. So Shared Interest is a lending institution operating out of UK, but we finance agribusinesses globally. So we are based in Nairobi for East Africa. Then we have an office in West Africa as well. And uh, we have a uh, counterpart offices in Latin America. So our focus is generally on agribusinesses, especially on the export markets. So in essence, I'm the lending manager, so we finance the businesses and that is what I'll be talking about. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Maclet. Great having you. Uh, Dr. Patrick, over to you. Patrick, Patrick, Adondu. Okay, as Patrick is preparing, uh, I think we can go to Daniel Mosioka. Daniel Mosioka, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, good evening. My name is uh, Daniel Zioko. Um, I'm, a manage, I'm the managing director at uh, Bar Farms Limited. Bar Farms Limited is a exporting horticultural exporting company uh, based in Kenya. Uh, we are specialists and the leaders in uh, uh, fruits. Uh, specifically, we uh, specialize in uh, four value chains: avocado, mango, and the passion fruit, and uh, recently uh, pineapples. Uh, we work. Um, directly with the uh, uh, farmers. Our supply uh, chain is premised on farmer uh, uh, production. And uh, I'm here representing the exporters or uh, aggregators perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel, I appreciate. Uh, Mr. Tom Kibet. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kimori. My name is uh, Tom Kibet, and I work for Nuru Kenya as a Chief Operations Officer. Basically, what we do in Nuru here is that uh, we support uh, communities, that is uh, farmers that we work with, 
and uh, we enable them to have self-propelling, self-sustaining means. So basically, we, we support these farmers to actually produce milk. Um, we facilitate in terms of ensuring they have a market. And generally, we uh, supply this market in various uh, markets. And then we are basically in Migori County, as well in Homer Bay County, and scaling towards uh, Baringo County. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, and, and welcome. Uh, Mr. Nehemiah Odongo, over to you. Hello. Yes, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, I'm called Nehemiah Odongo, Director of Magos Farm Enterprises. They are based in Kisumu, Kenya. Our main office is in Kisumu town. But if you visit us, you'll be able to find us there. We are a farm input supplier. Uh, we deal in fertilizer, seeds, uh, chemicals, and also kind of planning on climate smart agriculture. We were one of the grantees of SDMS RTI project and we are continuing. We are serving in Kisumu, Siaya, Vega, Busia, Migori, Homa Bay. So we have do a lot of distribution and we have developed a franchise business with our small and upcoming agro dealers that we supply on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nehemiah. Um, last but not least, Ms. Vivian Opolo. Vivian, over to you. Thank you, Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vivian Opolo, and I am based in Nairobi, Kenya. I am a co-founder and CEO of an agri-tech startup called Famula. What we do at Famula is we develop uh, software solutions for the agricultural space. Currently, we have a web platform where we give farmers visibility so that buyers can be able to buy produce directly from farmers, uh, removing all the irrelevant players ac across the supply chain. Um, yeah, and that's me. My background is tech. So I have a background in software development, data science, and software entrepreneurship. Thank you, Eric. Excellent. Uh, thank you and welcome, Vivian. So I think we'll just start. We'll go straight to the issues and uh, straight to the meat of the, of the position. Um, and, and I think that the background of this is really to, to paint us a picture of how the business was before COVID checked in, yeah? uh, and, and how it compares uh, to the situation today. So really, it's how was it before COVID? Uh, what happened? What changed? Um, and how is it right now? So. You can start with Tom, Tom uh, Kibet, uh, from your, your, your point of view. Uh, please paint us a, a rough picture of how business was uh, before COVID. Uh, then you take us to COVID, uh, and then, then we pick it up from there. Thanks. Tom. Thank you so much. Um, I would say that before COVID, things were really normal. We could do things in a normal way in terms of employment. Uh, People would meet, have uh, boardroom discussions, gatherings were allowed. There were, there were so many things that were normal. And uh, I'll just call it, it was normal. But when COVID broke in, uh, that is when we really found a major challenge in that when it came to employment, now we had to categorize staffing into essential and non-essential staff. You had to ensure that you are able to designate who would work from home and who would work from the factory. So for us, for example, we had people working in the field, providing extension services to our farmers. And now they could no longer visit the farmers. They could no longer have these gatherings because of the ban on gatherings, as well as the supermarkets whereby we were able to sell our produce. Now we could no longer have merchandisers. We could no longer have in-store promoters because these supermarkets were now looking into the COVID situation and trying to discongest the supermarkets and ensure that there's more space so that they can sell their produce. The other thing is that when it came to raw materials, we had a challenge in terms of deliveries. Since now time had been limited, there's don't to task curfew, 
And um, this delay in delivery of raw materials uh, perpetuated delay and shortages of product or stockouts in the supermarkets. The other thing that we faced was the operational hours. We are selling yogurt and milk products and basically the curfew from seven to seven affected that drastically, especially in the urban settings where the supermarkets are situated. We could no longer sell from five to 10 p.m., which was the peak time. Now it delayed the movement of the products, disseminating the cash flows of the business. And that basically affected the, big, the business big time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Tom. Um, so, so some disruptions right there, uh, disruptions in the, in the supply chains. I don't know, Daniel Mosioka, was your experience roughly the same or, uh, or slightly different? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, um, the pattern is more or less the same, but uh, allow me to just highlight some few things. Um, in the export uh, market, uh, logistical, uh, the logistics play a very critical and a central role in the whole value chain, um, uh, from farmer for sourcing of the produce, processing, and export. And uh, over the years that before the, the, the COVID, we had uh, established a very clear pattern how things flow uh, from farm level to park house and, all, and, and, and eventually to the customer. And, but what happened is uh, immediately when COVID uh, set in, there was panic everywhere and uh, measures put in place. Uh, and from the farm sourcing, um, the disruption on curfews and the travel regulation immediately affected the flow of materials. Uh, then the other aspect is on uh, the processing uh, that wasn't very much affected because uh, the, the, it was a recognized export and the food was recognized as an essential service. But on the market end, outbound logistic, uh, one of the, we have two options, uh, the air flight and uh, the uh, sea shipping. And uh, the air flight was completely affected. It was, the, 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 the flights were not available. And later when they became available, the rates were not attainable for the market. Uh, but uh, lucky enough, and we thank God, uh, we do about 80% of our shipping by sea. And that was still functional. Nonetheless, there was disruption with them. Um, on the transition points where a vessel could not uh, connect because uh, maybe the connecting vessels from uh, elsewhere were not available. Uh, and that disruption in the shipping industry affected the whole process by delays of uh, up to two. And in extreme case, we had a case where a, 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 a shipment was delayed for three weeks to reach to the customer. Um, so that there was the disruption, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the market level, the demand was sustained because uh, like some of the, the fruits where we supply, the COVID uh, awareness raised, uh, um, I mean, prompted demand, people wanted to have health feed. So the market was sustained. And uh, in fact, in our case, the demand was increased, but the logistic issue was the main, uh, uh, aspect or interest. So okay. that is how the situation was. Thank you. Thank you. So, so for you, logistics was really the biggest issue. Yeah. And, that's, yes. Uh, and, and, and yes, we, we did see lots of those uh, uh, sorts of things happening. Um, so let, let's go into those disruptions and how they did affect uh, when it came to, to lending and, the, and, and financing from a point of view of your businesses. So maybe you can go to Vivian. Uh, uh, Vivian, maybe from your point of view, uh, how did these um, disruptions, and the assumption is that your business was disrupted in the same way, but maybe you can tell us how it was disrupted because again, you as a tech business, if there are any differences between uh, what the two gentlemen have said and, and how that disruption then affected your relationship with your financiers or potential financiers. Thank you for that question, Eric. Um, yes, our business was disrupted more or less in the same way um, the other panelists' business were disrupted. But being that we are a software platform, um, 
there's a lot that didn't affect us directly, but people also found value in what we're doing. So I'll give you examples. We lost clients uh, only because now uh, money was tight for a lot of people. So then the retailers who are on our platform, like 50% uh, of them closed business. So now the demand all right, from the farmers went a bit low because we had lost clients. Uh, secondly, we also, people found value because now they could access produce and they had visibility of the farm without moving because now at this point you can't move and go to the farm. But the fact that we still had people on ground who are still providing that visibility of pro farmers produce, people found value in that. Um, we also found that there were more players in the space now. So competition went high. We're finding more people who are also selling produce uh, online, but they were targeting our uh, end consumers. So B2C, although we were B2B. So then that assured us that what we're doing um, is providing value and people are seeing it. Then uh, the movement being disrupted also forced us to adjust in that before we were the ones who were going on ground, onboarding farmers ourselves, and then putting them on our platform. But now we had to change our platform in a way that we don't have to physically be there, but uh, the people on ground who are helping us can then go and onboard farmers themselves. Uh, with regards to our relationship with our financiers, we, we were fortunate enough in 2020 to get investment, but at some point our investor was also finding that uh, as much as our revenue dipped, so our revenue went down because lost customers. So they were very skeptical on keeping, uh, giving us our fin finance. So we had to really be using our revenue, the ones that we were making to operate. So even our financiers were finding it a bit risky. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Vivian. Um, so, so what I hear is that the financiers uh, are, are having a bit of a, of a, of a conversation with you, uh, maybe to assess how the disruption was and, and how it has affected your business. I, I, I don't know whether that's the same, uh, that, that's the same view that, uh, that, um, that Mr. Nehemiah has. Um, Nehemiah Odongo, um, can give us your, uh, how the disruption was and specifically how that that affected your relationship with your financiers? <laughs> okay, the disruption was real. More so I mean, agriculture sector, the real one, on the low base, where the, where the low base of the supply chain. Uh, from us, we either go direct to the farmer or we go to the other distributor who has all the agro dealers who are near to the farm. And you, as you know, the financing to agriculture is quite low. And the banks can attest that. And since you're a banker, you understand that very well. So we were more disrupted and saying, okay, no, if even because they always believe that agriculture is financed from other sources. So even the people are coming to be farming and they are already having employed and they have disrupted from the employment part, they could not get that financial support in terms of even to us. During that time, we are not even able to. Uh, get us financed. I think even if I'm seeing some FC are here, FC are here, and we attest that due to the disruption, some of the activities were not able to progress because of the risk in uh, agriculture. But all in all, uh, I think when we pick it up and how do you cope and that, I think we'll be able to pick it from there. I think the, the story is the same. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Adogo. I think let's move now to the to the supply side there, eh? and they, they can give us a view. So I don't know, uh, Immaculate, um, um, we did hear, we've just heard from the demand side. I, I don't know whether from your point of view as a, as a lender or a holder of finance, whether experience was any different. Uh, Immaculate, maybe you can give us a view. Thanks. Okay. Yes, it was definitely quite different. So just to give a brief, um, in shared interest, we work a lot with the businesses or cooperatives who definitely are working directly with the farmers who are, let me say the first line producers, the primary producers. So previously what would happen like any lender before you finance, of course, you want to do your normal due diligence. And the requirement was that you would have actually have to visit the farmer or the business in their premises, have discussions with the farmer, go into the warehouses and see the stocks that they're just the normal due diligence that any financial want to do to get comfort in terms of the kind of business you're financing. So now come post COVID, there was lockdown. We are not able to travel. 
And now in East Africa, we are covering Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, as well as Rwanda, and we have a customer in Malawi. So without the travel and with the need to continue financing businesses, because well, if crops are in the season and they are going to get harvested, they still have to happen. So our customers were affected and we were affected as well. So what happened is that um, we were not able to do the normal due diligence that we do by traveling. So we had to switch to a virtual due diligence, which as Vivian has mentioned, required us to now start using the tech that, um, that is in the market. So previously, of course, you, know, you can imagine you're doing a due diligence on a farmer's mode through a Skype call or a Zoom call or a, just a normal phone call and say, can you do a video call? For some of them, it would work, very few of them. Sometimes they are willing, but well, the technology is not there or the link is weak. But all in all, I think over time, a lot of them have started embracing that. So we tend to have a lot more calls on Zoom and videos compared to what we used to do previously, because previously communication was on phone call or email. But as time goes by, we are doing a lot of communication through other platforms, and they're also able to share information. So that is just one of the key ways in which things have changed. But now, as I said, the customers were affected, so which affected us as well. Previously, as I think when somebody has mentioned, when you want to do the harvesting and uh, especially the export market, the way Daniel mentioned, the customers have to do a lot of monitoring to ensure that the quality of what they're producing is good. So they have to do a lot of field visits to ensure that production is at the required level and the required quality. Then what would happen if lockdown happened, they are not able to do the visits, so they cannot guarantee the quality of the produce going out. And all in all, at the end of the day, there is a delay in the whole process. So we finance a lot of our producers. Let me give an example of the coffee, the coffee industry in East Africa. So you have producers who have to get from the farming, then travel all the way to the processing facility before they can ship. And then remember when you went into lockdown, there are all these social distancing rules. So much as the agricultural sector was um, classified as essential services and they were able to get permits to continue operating, they were operating at a minimal level. So for example, if you had a factory and you're working with hundred people, suddenly you are told you have to work at that 50% capacity or 30% capacity. So if you are producing a certain amount within a certain period of time, all in all at the end of the day, you are taking a longer period to produce the same amount. So that delays the whole process all the way up to the exportation. And now I think so Daniel also mentioned the delay in shipping vessels. So we were affected as well because you have customers who have produced the coffee, but because of the restrictions of social distancing, it's taking them longer. And then when you have the restrictions in terms of how many people can you have in a factory or a processing facility at the same time, that is another added cost. And then when the government says, if you're dealing with the facilities, I mean, if you're dealing with food, you need staff who are vaccinated or already have a COVID negative um, certificate, so to speak. So that is also another added cost into the business. So now when it comes to the repayment of their facilities, we are impacted negatively. So it means um, a customer who had projected, say, I will produce by this month, be able to process and ship and sell by this month and repay the facility. The trickle down effect is that yes, the business is there. Yes, it's essential. They are still processing, but there is a delay. And then there is an increase in cost in terms of the COVID prevention protocol that the different governments have put in place. So we were affected in terms of repayments of the facilities. We were affected in terms of how quick is it for us to do an assessment on the customers when you are bringing them on board or before you do any disbursement on the drawdowns. And then when it comes to even just gathering information. So for example, if you want to do an assessment on a customer and you say, provide us with some data. And they will say, you see right now, I'm not able to do that because um, we're operating at 50% capacity or 30% capacity. So this week, maybe the finance person is not in office. So you have to wait for the next time. This week, maybe it's a different person. So the amount of time it takes to gather the documentation that require to process any deal is actually lengthened. So something that would take you maybe three weeks now becomes triple. So those are the challenges that we are facing. But um, I think through the virtual due diligence and the way the customers are also trying to embrace the technology, we are trying to mitigate those ones and uh, reduce the time lapse that it would normally take to gather the documentation. Thank you, Eric. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Martinet. That, that, that was quite good. Um, and, and it brings out the adaptations that you've had to go through, uh, the virtual due diligences. Those things were virtually unheard of a couple of years ago, in fact, not too long ago. 
I don't know, uh, uh, Patrick Radondo, um, uh, I, I hope you are now uh, around. Maybe you can tell us, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Karibu. Uh, maybe you can tell us from your point of view, maybe you can start by introducing yourself. We, we tried to get you earlier. Uh, and then you tell us from that point of view of adapting and disruptions. How was your experience um, in India? Thank you. Thank you, Eric, and sorry for the area disruption now. I got a challenge, but I'm happy to be back. My name is Patrick Kathondu. I'm the Chief Executive of BIMAS Kenya Limited, a microfinance institution that is based in Nembu, but serving in 19 counties. I want to move to the question and very quickly say that uh, uh, our experience was not different from what the market has shared. However, because of the fact that we deal with the people that are down there in the pyramid, the, 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 the rural poor, uh, our, our challenge maybe was a little bit different. Uh, the way we deliver our, 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 our business is that we have group mechanisms and we have uh, individual leading. At uh, the group level, we are com were completely beaten. This is because we could not be able to meet our customers. We could not uh, even be able to do any loan appraisals. We couldn't be able to collect, uh, mainly because we couldn't even gather people together. And this is because of the protocols that were employed by the government. And therefore, we found ourselves in a very precarious position where we have a business that we cannot even be able to touch and we cannot be able to really deliver on because we couldn't move. The other challenge we got now that we are not even disbursing and we were coming from a very good year 2019 where we had uh, borrowed a lot of funds and we had uh, a lot of funds that we were ready to disperse to the people, we found ourselves in a position where liquidity was a bit too high because mm -hmm. we're not uh, giving these loans yet, we are paying interest on them. And therefore we had to develop a mechanism of allowing us to even disburse these funds. And, and one is that uh, we, we were lucky to have just employed a um, heavy mobile uh, system that we rolled on during the COVID time 2020. And, 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 and uh, we were also able to uh, push a lot of uh, information out there for our customers, mainly to give, uh, to give them hope because we thought at that time what we needed to give us hope. The disruption maybe we would talk about that is a little bit different from Immaculate is because we, the, the people that were producing were not so hardly hit. So the production was still there and there was a bit of demand. However, as an institution, you're shying away from lending because you're not even sure what will happen tomorrow. I mean, we're not able to meet these clients. If you are to give loans, will you be able to collect those loans? We saw early payment rates going to the worst we have ever seen. At one time, we had a repayment rate of 25%, meaning that we had a PAR of over 75%. That is something that has not been heard of in this uh, sector. However, uh, slowly we have been able to get out of that. And of course, we had to make a very quick adjustment changing our policies to be able to accommodate the changes that were coming. And of course, enlightening people uh, uh, more into using technology and mobile banking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tari. I uh, really appreciate that. Now, um, now let's go to, let's wear a different hat now. Let's assume we are prophets and we can predict how things are going to be uh, into the future. Um, um, what do you think is going to stick and what do you think is going to change? And in terms of adapting, um, how do you guys think it will work out? Huh? So maybe I can start with you, Dakari. We just talked with you uh, not in, uh, just now. What do you think in your view? What do you think will stick? What do you think will change? Uh, a minute uh, to, to think that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that question. I think COVID is a very big uh, lesson for all of us. I think we have moved from resolve, we have tested our resilience, and we have to get away to return back to, to business. And this is what we're calling reimagination. And there are so many things that are going to stick with us. One is that we must uh, be sure uh, that uh, disruptions will forever be there. I mean, we are not going to have this uh, COVID going any anytime soon. That doesn't mean that we are not going to do business going forward. And therefore we have to bring in models that will help us um, realize the businesses that we have set. For example, 
and, and I'm very happy and proud of what uh, ACDMS has done for us, is that we have to adopt technology, whether we like it or not. This issue of us visiting groups and uh, visiting customers and ensuring that we talk to them face to face might not happen. I mean, it is going to be something that maybe will be of the past. And uh, out of the uh, support that we have gotten, for example, from KCDMS, it has helped us really adopt in that now we have to get documentation from the customers without having to physically see them. We have to invest in serious um, uh, appraisal processes that do not require us to go to the customer to where they are. We, we should be able to have um, a proper testing for the appraisals that we are going to be doing. And, and that means that we have to employ techniques that will allow us to be able to identify who is a good client, who is a bad client, who are we going to lead to and who are we not going to lead to. We have employed the credit calling, which is something that maybe was not previously being done in microfinance, we, we have to scan the documents and send them via email wherever they get and then approval levels that will have to be channeled through an electronic data manage, document management system. These are things that are going to stay. And, and the other thing that we have to, to really um, be aware of is that agriculture is one of the most resilient areas. And as one of the most resilient areas, we have to put a case for this agri, agri uh, business. And, and we have to ensure that uh, we serve the people because that is the um, thing that is not going to be affected. I said earlier that a majority of the people, even when they couldn't work, they went into agriculture. These are people who require funding. And these are people that will not be ignored at any given time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you. I uh, really appreciate that, that, that insight. Uh, Nehemiah, um, from your view, uh, if you pick the same question now as a demand uh, on the demand side, uh, what do you think in your business is going to stick? What do you think will change? Uh, um, how do you think the disruption will last? Uh, Nehemiah, thanks. Yeah, uh, to, to our standing as uh, farming to suppliers, and then there's uh, the value chain, we realize that people have to eat three times a day for good health. And therefore, as magos, we will have to be there to avail these products. So COVID is there with us. We we'll have to ensure that we take the cautions. Uh, then we'll, we'll need to have uh, our shops and our farmers going on with their activity. What we now what we now going to adapt here is one is how are we going to reach out to our farmers, and therefore we have realized that we have. But from the history, you maybe just take you back when we realized that how are we going to adopt this? This one where in March last year, we we have to push KSDMS seriously to to find us in, and we are lucky that by April last year. When the real set of COVID, you are signed in and you started the work. So I'm um, happy because of that one. So we had already seen what the discussion that are asking. This thing is going to be with us, and therefore, how are we going to adopt to this? And that's when we have to start the franchise business. We have to ha have a structure where we have a reliable uh, agro dealers who are far away, who are nearer the farmer, because we noted that the even the transport sector is going to be disrupted, cost of transport is going to increase. Therefore, we wanted people that we'll be able to work with, whom we'll be able to take the product from our shops to their nearest the shop and where the farmers are. And that one will be able to reduce the farmers from moving far the part. And therefore, we are also going to get the revenue. Another part is that another part is that we are able to all use the same farmers to get more. So we are developing them in called farm agent system, whereby those, those ones are going to stay with us because of the COVID. And then we have also the project that we are now pushing and the idea that we are saying, how many youth can we engage? And then for within that time, we are to buy four motorbikes, whereby the, our youngsters can be able to deliver the products to the farmers. Uh, therefore, that one is going to stay with us, and with the COVID, we have to be resilient to it. 
Okay. Excellent. So thank you. Thank you, Nehemiah. Um, I think we can now go to the questions. There are a couple of questions that are coming through and so uh, in the chat. And if anyone has a question, they can put it in the chat. Uh, it, it will get to me. And then we, we can pick a few questions. So we'll just tackle about two or three right now. Uh, and the first one goes to uh, uh, Dr. Patrick. As you can understand, most questions will end up with the, the financing people. And the question is this, um, and I'll read it verbatimly. Uh, I wonder if you lenders, funds, ETC, uh, were able to flex, to issue flexible terms of repayment uh, in your organization. In other words, was there space for renegotiation? So uh, 30 seconds, Patrick, on that. Thank you very much, Eric. And, and I want to say that here, uh, COVID uh, gave us another opportunity to engage our customers because at one time we realized that uh, people could not be able to pay the monies and installments that they were supposed to pay. And therefore we had to sit with them and agree how can we be able to avail them some hope. Like I said, it, it is about renegotiating and talking to the people. The only thing that we as an institution are very careful about is not to let people take that as a panacea or to uh, even start imagining that it is going to lift the burden that they had for those who had loans. So we, we put it very straight to the people who are seeking to uh, have flexible terms. What does it mean? Is it going to create some in increase in interest? Are you going to have more costs? And, and we reasoned with people. For those who could do nothing, we were able to agree and flex terms. And there are those who actually went back and said, let me carry my burden and try to pay the loan as it was. And, and those were the people, um, uh, because it is about financial literacy, it's about understanding the commitments that you have, and then making a decision with what you have at stake. So yes, we did negotiate, we did refinance, we did uh, even restructure loans, but that was based on case by case basis. Okay, thank you, thank you. I, 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 I'll pick another one, and, and this one I'll take it to, to, to Immaculate. Eh? And it says, um, um, how, how do financiers ensure that agribusinesses are financed in spite of the challenges, which is a good question. Uh, and then are export-oriented crops the only financiable crops? Uh, so, so Immaculate. Yes. Okay, yeah. let me start with the second one. No, it is not only export crops which are financiable. I think any crop as long as, because finance is all about you have an end buyer, you have a producer. So as long as you can produce, yes, you will have a financial who are financing more of the exports, but you also have financial who are financing the local industry. So to answer your question, both export as well as the local or regional crops can actually be financed when it comes to agribusinesses. But um, to answer your other question, how do we get to finance agribusinesses? I would say it's like any other business, but the only difference is that agri is normally seen as a more high risk area compared to the other sectors. Just as Eric had mentioned that if you had a property deal, it would get financed faster compared to an agri deal. So yes, we do finance agri, but what has happened is that over time, the financiers have come up with structures and processes that try to mitigate the risks with the agri. Because let me give an example of the flooding that happened last year. Nobody saw that coming and a lot of agri business were affected. So we are financing an area which you know, there are certain risks that you will face that you might not be able to mitigate. So that then brings in the aspect of climate change. So what is being done in that area? So as financiers, you cannot be able to mitigate climate change, but you can work with other stakeholders who can train then the producers to work on climate mitigation changes or how they can prevent themselves to get to be getting hard hit when they start facing those kind of challenges. But then again, the other aspect I'll say, we have had situations whereby either with, the, with other partners or other stakeholders, we try to do a lot of training on governance, business management, just to bring the businesses to a point whereby we can be at a, the same level, so to speak, so that we are speaking the same language where they understand the financing requirements and we understand the kind of challenges that they're facing, then we can be able to structure the facilities that um, in a way that actually works better for work, works better for both of us. I hope that answers the question. I think it does. I think you put it very well. Um, uh, I think that the, the main issue that we just wanted to deal with was 
uh, adaptability and, and to say that actually businesses need to adapt because that seems to be the only co uh, constant that change is going to come. Now, uh, let, let's go to Tibet, Tom, maybe some closing remarks from a, a demand side perspective. Um, what do you think a business uh, needs to think about at this time? Um, what do you think are the key important variables that one needs to consider from the a business perspective uh, in view of what, we, what has just happened. Uh, maybe 30 seconds for that, Tom. Thank you very much. Um, a business needs to think about the sustainability of that particular business going forward. How are you going to support your farmers or the people that uh, rely on your business? A good example is how we were able to lift ourselves from the predicament that we are in through ensuring that the farmers were able to get the market of their produce. And when we are working with the Kenya crop and market dairy systems, they were able to support us to ensure that we accessed finances that propelled the organization to support the farmers and the youth who were basically transporting the milk to the business, as well as the farmers to get their livelihoods. You understand that during COVID, the market were closed. They could not have the livestock markets whereby they were supposed to sell their animals. And since Nuru is basically working with the community, it is ensuring that the community are able to transform their livestock from the ones that are indigenous to the ones that are improved. And through that, it enabled them to have financing. When we paid the milk, they were able to finance for their heifers through the revolving fund that we are supporting them with. The other thing that I think is very important uh, is how these farmers will access services, especially like extension services. So there's a model that also we worked with that came through the Kenya Crop Dairy Market System, which we call the Dairy Farmer Assistant, whereby the youth are trained to ensure that the services, uh, the farmers can get services in terms of AI, in terms of clinicals, and that is through the support that we got through the financing from one of the local banks, which we worked with, the Kenya Dairy, um, the KCDMS program. So basically that's what I would say for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, uh, greatly appreciated for that. Uh, I don't know, Daniel Mosioka, uh, in your view, how would you tackle that same uh, question from, uh, from your perspective? What do you think will stick uh, into the future? Daniel. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Um, uh, businesses are always prone to uh, disruptions. Uh, could it be COVID or something else? And uh, one of the key issue is to integrate uh, risk mitigation measures in a business as part of business management. A quick one, just to elaborate what happened is uh, just before COVID, we had uh, received a co-investment um, uh, from KCDMS and that unlocked um, uh, financing from two institutions. Um, they, and that happened at just at the start of COVID. And this institution were very categorical. It's, they are only giving, releasing the finances because we have received a co-investment from uh, uh, KCDMS. But so we had an opportunity to do business because we had the finances. So what we did was a very deliberate effort to do a profiling of our business risk from for, for the whole value chain. And that was very instrumental. Um, and what I want to say, the experience before then, what has happened, some of those, those risks that we identified is what we are running the business today uh, based on the same we have more shifted to risk-based management approach. And uh, my assessment this year so far, our sales uh, returns uh, is about 95%, while in the previous years before COVID was at 80%, as an 85%. 85%. So because of uh, embracing a risk-based approach, uh, it's it's uh, it's been possible to increase the, the return. You know the perish, the word of perishables. There are cases where you have a credit because of uh, something up, the credit not request because of something happening. So we are the performance right now is far much better than the situation before, because of uh, integrating risk based management. 
And that is something that we are going to carry on going forward um, as a, a good business management practice. Excellent, and I think and I think that's uh, that's an interesting point. You know, when uh, uh, a business takes a risk based approach to to their growth strategy and how they are going to which businesses they will do mm. and which ones they will not. So I think that was excellent on your side, uh, Vivian. And uh, you know, as a as a young person and from a tech side, uh, doing farming, I mean, you you just mix it all. So maybe you can tell us in closing. Uh, what your views are um, into the future and uh, looking at how things are right now. What do you think? Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Um, so moving on, I feel like the trends I'm seeing right now in the agricultural space, not only on the continent or in Kenya, uh, some of the things I think will stick, especially on the continent, are people will still be farming like on land. Things like vertical farming wouldn't be that much, especially because on the continent, we have a lot of uh, farmland that is still not yet uh, occupied. So then there'll still be um, the people who will be farming the most are smallholder farmers, as opposed to commercial farmers, right? So smallholder will still be the majority. And then it, the sector will still be leaning towards the informal side, especially on the market side, the retailers, mama bogas will still have those. So that will stick. And then the last thing I see is um, with regards to what will stick is if financial institutions still uh, vet uh, people in the space the way they do without even coming in and understanding further. Like us, we're not on the input side or we're not farming. Uh, right, so everything that's not needed stays in the farm and all this process stuff then comes to the urban centers. There'll be a lot of modern farming, we're talking hydroponics, um, a lot of automation will be done and we're trying to do that, whereby someone, our buyers don't then have to place orders every time, but instead we are aware because we collect this information, we're aware when they're about to run out and then we just restock them. Uh, so such processes will be automated. And lastly, people will depend so much on data insights when trying to give financial uh, uh, support or even when uh, trying to do processes on the farm such as watering or applying manure. So there'll be a lot of data insights that will be used. So that's what I think will change. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, thank you, Vivian. Uh, so, so there you've had it, huh? and 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 I, I I quite agree with what Vivian is saying. I think the direction will be more around the uh, Internet of Things and, uh, and and a lot of automation and a lot of uh, uh, agriculture happening in small spaces. Uh, there will be a lot of urban agriculture that is going to happen. As we are right now, I think a lot of vegetables we eat in the city are coming from people's backyards in in very small small spaces. So, I think that is going to stick. I also think that uh, financial institutions will be forced to move away from uh, security-based lending because I'm sure someone like Vivian is not interested in owning property. She just wants to run, to run her business. And so you have to look for ways of funding her in a sustainable way. So, but then on, on us also is on the business owners to run the business in a way that makes sense to the financial institutions so that uh, the two institutions kind of meet halfway uh, where banks can give you money with a clear view of how things may turn out. And, uh, and also we can do businesses with the funding in mind. So when a business is set, is set up, how do you set it up so that it makes sense to a financial institution? Because financial producers are very important stakeholders in this business. So we can't set up a business without having them in mind. So we have to set up a new business in a way that will make sense to financial institutions. And also financial institutions, they need to start understanding that change is coming and things, and there are younger and more younger people coming up who may not be able to give you title deeds and all these other securities that are needed nowadays to get lending. So we've had very many questions and most of them, we may not be able to handle them right now. 
uh, and, and we are constrained for time. But I think uh, the, 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 the team is going to pick all these questions. We will then refer them to the panelists for responses. We've had very many questions and we're very really happy about that participation. But for right now is to thank you, panelists, for your time and the insights that you've given us. We really appreciate it. So let me take this back to Doreen. Doreen, uh, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank our panelists who've contributed to this conversation and thank you very much, Eric, for the good moderation and all the questions coming in. So we shall move to the next session. Uh, as uh, Eric has mentioned, there's a constraint of time as we watch the clock. And from our end, we just wanted to play a small short video uh, as we prepare to go to now the panel uh, section where we'll have the discussions. Just uh, let me just... My name is Farai Ziswa, and uh, I'm the CEO of FarmShop uh, Limited. And FarmShop is a group of agrovet retail chains, retail stores based across Kenya that are franchised. And we specialize in selling all forms of agricultural produce, including seeds, feeds, fertilizers, uh, agricultural uh, tools and accessories and we supply them to uh, bank and, and services, and we supply them across um, the range of all the small scale farmers across Kenya. By the time we reached uh, beginning of 2020, we were training 2000 farmers by March uh, on best agricultural production and selling the product to the farmers. And then COVID came. And uh, the impact of that was immediate because the first thing was we were cut off. Uh, we had lockdown, so we training stopped completely. But challenge really was as we had the stockouts, we still had to pay salaries. We still had to pay for, uh, for stock that we had already purchased and we had credit lights. The biggest challenge we had was re reimbursing this money. And uh, first thing we had to do was trim our number of staff, which unfortunately really wasn't a good situation. Uh, we had to revise our ways of operating, reducing our costs. But when we tried to go to the banks to borrow and said we would like to finance, to get financing to get us out of this bottleneck that we're in, uh, banks unfortunately asked us a lot of data so we would send significant numbers of documents they would ask for this document that document we send all these documents and they keep asking for more documents and then at the end of it all they would reject the offer and unfortunately they didn't also guide us on what the issue was and it was only later on that we realized that a lot of what we were asking for assistance for was non-recurrent expenses. So to banks, that's not attractive, but nobody says that. Um, so banks became a challenge to get financing. We've just introduced uh, online selling and we've just started marketing our product and our productivity online with a completely new supply chain model. Uh, when we came out with our revised models and started selling and started generating income and started actually being able to repay salary, backdated salaries and started seeing the viability of it. it that is when the banks actually started saying, okay, that's interesting. And we had one or two banks that even said they would like to visit and see the projects. So thank you so much for uh, your patience. You've been able to see that video and uh, what the video is basically talking about is echoing the sentiments as we've had from the fireside conversation in terms of the challenges that um, farmers and even just MSMEs have been facing during the COVID downtime. So uh, it's just to bring 
more voices from the ground to solidify the conversation that we are having today. And we do hope that in the next session, in the panel session, we'll be able to brainstorm some of the ways in which we can be able to support and help these MSMEs build back better. So back to you, Eric, so that you can run the panel section. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I think we'll go now to the panel session, as um, Doreen has mentioned. And uh, I will, uh, we will be having a panel, a panel of three. Um, and we we'll start with, uh, there is John, John Kashangaki. Uh, John, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with him uh, during my times at, uh, at the Kenya Investment Mechanism. So we did quite a bit of things with him and I'm happy that he's on this panel. I uh, really appreciate that. We have uh, Jahazi David, um, he's from MasterCard Foundation, and we are happy to have him. Uh, there is also Dr. Juliet Ongwai, who again, I had the pleasure of working with her when we were young people in the starting our banking career. I also worked with her when I was in the development world. So these are people I'm very, very happy to introduce and to have in this session. So I think I'll start with John. John, maybe you can just uh, introduce yourself, say one or two things, uh, and then we'll go to, to uh, Jahazi. Thank you. John? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Eric, and nice to engage with you and the panel, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as mentioned, uh, I'm with Kenya Investment Mechanism as an advisor, and I've worked with them for the past three years. Uh, Kenya Investment Mechanism is a sister uh, program to KCDMS that is focusing on stimulating finance and investment into key sectors uh, of the economy, including agriculture and agribusiness, uh, and really is using a market systems approach, focusing on both the supply side, working with financial institutions, and on the demand side, working with uh, investment advisors to stimulate and structure investments with companies to get them financed. So I hope to discuss a little bit about the experiences that we've had also in this COVID period. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Excellent. Uh, Jahazi, David Jahazi. Thank you. you so much, Eric. Thank you so, thank you so much, Eric. Uh, and I'm really happy to be here. I'm, I'm glad from today, you will no longer say you've not worked with me because you, you said you've worked with John and Juliet. I'm so happy that from today, next time we meet, you'll actually say you've also worked with Jahazi. But I'm really excited to be here. And my first shot goes to uh, the, the former panel, like the panelists who've just uh, from speaking, the young people, people from the supply side, the demand side, a lot of insights coming through um, and just articulating the issues that, that the agriculture sector is going through. So kudos to that. And, and thanks panelists for that good job. Um, I'm Jahazi David, um, MasterCard Foundation Program Lead uh, Youth Engagement. Um, we are excited to, make, to, to, to actually tackle the issue of unemployment head on. And um, as a foundation, we, have, we, we are committed to creating over 30 million jobs, and not just any jobs, but jobs that the young people see as dignified and fulfilling. And at the heart of that is the agriculture sector. So really excited to be here. And um, let me also stretch it and say we we are we are we are youth driven, youth focused, and we we really value the voices of the young people. So in everything we do, we have them at the center and at the and, and at the front of everything we do. So really excited to be here and to have this conversation. And Eric, thank you. I noticed even in the panel, you also had the young people. That was really exciting to me to even just listen to the young people themselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Appreciate it. Um, Dr. Juliet. Thank you, Eric. And I agree with the Jahazi. Um, I'm one of the young ones. So Eric, don't say when we were young, we are still young. So as Eric has uh, mentioned, I'm Juliet Ongwai and I work for uh, Microsoft or MSC Africa. So we are consulting firm with um, and we're in about 11 locations. So we support government and private sector with um, you know, digital financial services. Um, so I lead the digital transformation practice group. And um, as we, we've been hearing today, 
the first reaction to COVID was to go digital. So we've been supporting uh, financial institutions and um, also government um, in their endeavor to you know, transform digitally. So it's a pleasure to be here and give some of my insights. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Um, Asante Sana and, and the panelists. Thank you. Uh, it's great having you. Um, I think for us, again, the, the, the analysis will be in the same way uh, that we did with the other uh, panel, which is very simple. How was it before? How was it in terms of business as usual? Uh, when COVID came along, what changed? And uh, what do you think will be done or what has changed? What do you think will stick? What do you think will not stick? So I think those are the things that we are trying to analyze in this, in this place so that we can learn from each other and not just learn from a purely theoretical perspective, but learn from what has actually happened. So, uh, and that's the beauty of this conversation. So um, we can start with John uh, from a, a macro perspective. Um, so what do you think have been the sustained impacts of COVID on, on, on the economy from, from an economic perspective? Uh, you know, I know we are talking about a helicopter view of this issue, but from that perspective, what, what do you think are the main uh, issues and the main uh, facets and nuggets of things that are happening at that level? And how do you think they've been impacted uh, by COVID? John. Great, thanks. And um, I'll just share the experience based on what we've, we've seen. Uh, and open to discussions. And also kudos to the, the, the team that came before, because I think they gave us a lot of fodder, uh, which we can use to share. So from, from what we've seen, I think everybody, and, and from the discussions that came earlier, um, let's, let's start with the supply side. Uh, on the supply side, or maybe, look, let me start from the demand side, companies. Um, basically their supply chains were affected. Um, in some cases, we saw the, ex the experience of the exporter, transport logistics uh, changed, um, you know, the dynamics of that changed. Um, in terms of the, the fact that we had curfews, we found that um, certain businesses lost customers overnight, it affected their liquidity. Uh, so there was a lot of disruption. Um, and with uncertainty, uh, businesses really have to decide whether they are able to pivot or, or die. So we saw examples of, of, of the pivoting. And it's not easy to pivot, uh, but we saw a lot of businesses going through challenges of liquidity um, and having to pivot. What we've seen in discussions, uh, particularly the larger businesses were able to negotiate with the financial sector, particularly the banking sector, some of their facilities to allow them uh, to make that pivot. Uh, some of the medium and smaller businesses, even as we heard, had challenges getting uh, renegotiating. Some were able to, others were not. Um, so we saw really a, little, a lot of change in terms of how businesses were operating and how they accessed uh, liquidity. Um, in terms of accessing capital, the key issue was, I think, particularly last year and even into this year, we found that uh, a lot of the advisors in our network had challenges um, helping business ra raise capital because of uncertainty. You know, capital is very flows only when they can see the future. And it was very difficult to do projections uh, or for the future. So a lot of businesses had challenges getting capital. That said, we did see businesses with good business models uh, where presentations were made to investors. It took a little bit of time, but we did see businesses able to actually raise particularly uh, longer term capital to help them grow. I think I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, thank you, John. And I think you, you hit it very well. Um, there are obviously some businesses that uh, took it as an opportunity. Uh, and one of those would be uh, maybe in the flower sector. So when this thing came up, things, things were really bad, but then afterwards, uh, because of also the disruptions that happened in Europe, uh, when we started exporting, you know, things, things were not so bad. Uh, things actually improved and were able to make profits that covered the losses that happened. Um, I, I don't know, Juliet, um, what would your view be um, just around the same issue uh, from, from your point of view? 
um, what do you think actually happened and, and, and what uh, do you foresee happening? Okay, thank you. Um, so when I was listening to the stories, um, three things came to mind, you know, first was disconnect, you know, um, as soon as the pandemic hit, disconnect from markets, from your customers, from your partners. Um, we also had um, agility, you know, the need uh, for, for institutions, uh, providers to be agile and, and flexible enough, you know, to, to quickly change and adapt. And then we also had um, innovate, um, you know, the, the, the ability for them to innovate and move with the times. Um, and so we're hearing a lot of digital. So in terms of opportunities and, you know, what I see, you know, areas uh, for them, I would start with, um, we have to talk about mobile money and how critical it is in reaching the rural communities, um, especially uh, in, in the time of crisis. So we saw that even the first policy, you know, um, reaction was around, you know, um, mobile money and shifting uh, us towards, you know, using mobile money. And so um, those, the, the policies were around um, making mobile money affordable you know, for us um, during that time. Um, second, I want to talk about agri-e-commerce, possibly becoming the new normal. Um, so we are seeing that these agri-tech um, solutions that connect, you know, the, the farmers directly to consumers um, and also digitizing these market linkages becoming the new normal. And we are seeing, you know, uh, companies like Twiga Foods, um, you know, um, partnering with Jumia platform to be able to, you know, sell their fresh produce online. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities um, for, for, for people to move towards e-commerce. Um, opportunities around e-learning platforms. So we had disconnect in terms of engaging with your customers, being able to continue with financial literacy and also um, agronomic training. Um, so leveraging on e-learning platforms, you know, to be able to now continuously engage with your customers is definitely an area of opportunity. And uh, I can go on and on, but one more just around you know, leveraging more on digital technologies, um, especially for risk management. Um, so I, I think I had uh, Dr. Patrick talking about um, credit scoring. So leveraging on, you know, our new information systems to collect data, you know, looking at geotagging, remote sensing uh, systems to be able to provide real-time data so that it can help, um, especially the financial service providers be able to, you know, make their credit uh, or their lending decisions uh, faster. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Juliet. And, and I think you raise uh, many, many important points there, you know, mobile money, e-commerce, e-learning, um, you know, the banking sector, um, generally from my experience, working from home was unheard of actually. So there was a view that when you're in the office, that's when you're working now. Um, now things have changed. Uh, nowadays, uh, uh, people are having to give a reason why they need to go and work in the office. You actually need, formal approval to go to the office. And that's a change that is going to, to, to last. I don't think that's going to change. And the real estate uh, commercial property uh, financing is going to change. So I think this is an opportunity for a Greek to take advantage of that change because while it has gone against proper commercial property, um, it is coming to the advantage of a Greek. So I don't know, um, Jahazi, maybe you can change the story a bit and tell us from a point of inclusion, for, for both the uh, women and the youth. What have you seen now uh, uh, happening um, in view of what is going on right now? Thanks. Uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Eric and, and Juliet and John for articulating those very good points. Um, I think, Eric, what, what as a foundation we've done is um, we, we've also done a, a lot of diagnostic during this period. You will remember that before the COVID situation in the country, we were grappling with the issue of climate change, especially at the global 
global level and some change of leadership in areas like the US and, and, and the effect of the leadership on, uh, on global climate and, and all that, uh, then the, the locust invasion came. And before we could actually figure out what to do, COVID was in the country. And, and you just look at that curve and you notice we're just running as a country. And then if you listen to Joseph, you listen to Immaculate, you listen to Vivian, it was very clear that COVID came and one of the biggest issue beyond job cuts, beyond lack of restriction of movement and pay cuts was lack of information on what to do. A crisis is here and young people, young women in the rural areas in very urban areas who are in agriculture did not know what to do. Um, we grew up, us growing up, for example, myself very growing up, I only remember my parents talking of the coup that was in 1982 and they would share that story. Uh, in Western Kenya, I, I, I think only remember my parents. I, I, my parents come from Busia as well. And they were talking about a, a locust invasion that came some time back, you know, back in the day. This generation of young people, Eric, did not know what to do when a crisis has happened. You wake up, you're not going, you, you're not allowed to go to a particular county. And we didn't know what to do for a minute, you know? So I think that aspect of lack of information and not knowing what to do was critical. Secondly, we noticed that the COVID situation was going to undo a lot of the gains we had done as MasterCard Foundation, you know, in the lives of young people. Um, so we quickly, from last year, August to right now, we've actually been doing what we're calling reimagining process, trying to make sure that our approach of creating 30 million jobs by the, the year 2030 actually reflects the current realities and it's awake to the challenges and the realities on the ground. Um, so when we talk about inclusion, that, that is at the heart of everything we do. And what we what we we, we and what I'll be sharing here today is, is basically what we've heard from the young people themselves. And quickly, Eric, what we did in terms of inclusion, we actually brought the young people into the room. And we've actually been talking to the, the youth. We've had forums with the young people. And in that, in that light, we consider the views of the young, young women. We consider the use of uh, the views of youth living with disability. We consider the youth, the views of uh, youth, youth internally displaced young people and also youth refugees, because refugee inclusion is also very important in this conversation. So uh, as a foundation, what do we see, Eric? We see the secret source to us coming up with some sustainable solution, especially in, in youth and agriculture, is us listening to the voice of the young people. We have to go to them and listen to them you know, um, and allow them to speak to us and tell us what is happening, you know. Um, like you, you, you hear, I, I, see, I saw the video by the agrovet. The agrovet reached a place and he can't even pay bills. He's struggling to pay to, to run his recurrent expenditures. You know, finance, the, the supply side needs to come and listen to such a client and ask them, what are your issues? What are the dynamics, you know? Uh, and then secondly, Eric is, we cannot treat the young people or the youth as a monolith. They are not a monolithic. They are not the same. Uh, the, the, the rural areas, in the rural areas, young people experience different challenges with those who are in the very urban areas and those who are doing agriculture in the, in the urban areas. Like uh, Vivian was saying, issues of hydroponic are coming up. Um, you know, in the very urban areas where we don't have a lot of land, those, those young people have different challenges. So we need to listen to them um, and take care Take, take in charge of that. And then finally, Eric, another thing that we've seen this period of COVID uh, period is an increase in gender-based violence cases in the country. By the time we were hitting end of May last year, the figures were scary, like the, the, they, they had really shot up. And thinking about majority of, uh, you know, of the labor force in agriculture being in the rural areas, and then there is a restriction and people can't move around. Um, and then, you're seeing high rates of gender-based violence, and some of these young women are involved in agriculture. Then there is a lot. There was a huge disruption. They couldn't continue with their with their activities as, as, as it were, you know. And, and those are some of the things that we have to be awake to. And we have we've had interventions um, both in access to finance as a foundation. So we needed to safeguard the existing uh, uh, enterprises. Uh, and those in agriculture are not left behind. We work with partners who provide finances. Then finally. We also had interventions to take care of the gender-based violence victims so that we can ensure they continue their livelihoods. Okay. 
thank you. Thank you for that uh, extensive response, uh, David. Uh, we really appreciate it. And, and I think you guys are doing something very good. So, so as, a, as a yes or a no uh, to you, David, uh, do, do you think the changes benefited the women and youth or do you think they came out worse off? Um, I think I think when, when at the beginning we were responding to the crisis, ensuring that the young women have masks, uh, they have sanitizers. They, there's a hand washing station next to them, and especially those living in some you know some high 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 what we're calling the hotspot areas. So at the beginning of that was actually the the focus, just to make sure that we save lives. But we soon went into building resilience. And for example, with the with the intervention on on, on gender-based violence, we were able to make sure that when, when we identify a case, then we, we get counselors, you know, uh, uh, counselors who are able to take, to give them therapy and make sure that they are, they are okay. If we needed, um, they, they need a legal address, then we had some pro bono lawyers that would actually come and help them with drafting their cases and appearing in court. But the bigger picture was actually to take them through, you know, give them business skills you know, and allow them to be able to have business skills of bouncing back um, better and also accessing finance. So the answer is, I would say, our efforts have actually made sure that we've, we've started to build resilience. And as and one, of, one of the panelists said, we need to make sure that we, we, we adopt the new normal and come up with new models that actually build resilience and allow us to adopt the new normal, yes. Okay, okay. Good. Uh, thanks. Um, John, to, to you. Um, so what do you think are some of the interventions that uh, the development actors or governments can undertake or are undertaking to address these negative effects? So, and what, how do you think these opportunities can be exploited by both the, the development actors and governments in your view? Yeah. yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, I think what we, if, if you look at the, the, Western, the Western world, for example, where some of these countries have significant resources, if you look at the key strategy they had uh, and continue to have during this COVID period is to stabilize consumption. And to stabilize consumption, uh, you know, if you look at the US, for example, there were the stimulus checks. Uh, if you look at the UK, uh, for example, anybody who had to get rid of somebody uh, or, or, or um, retrench, there was a way the people who were retrenched would get access to capital. Unfortunately, in economies like ours, those resources are, are, are constrained. Uh, so there are measures that you could take, and the government did take some measures, particularly Initially, uh, the measure on um, reducing the tax rate. And we know that um, individuals that earn the money that we earn in Kenya, uh, there's the extended family, and that very often helps to cushion. Um, there are some measures as well across specific industries for certain uh, cushions, to be, for example, in the tourism industry. But we have, we have had mixed results uh, in some of these sectors. Uh, we've also seen the government look specifically, particularly for SMEs, uh, and we heard again the example of the of, of farm shop. Liquidity became a real issue, um, and just managing recurrent expenses. Uh, financial institutions, uh, the government has set up what we call a guarantee scheme, where businesses can come in and get some support. Uh, the banks have more incentive to work with some of these uh, these businesses because of the government backed guarantee, and they're able to allow liquidity to come into the system. Um, we need to appraise though, how effective these, these measures have been, but these are some of the measures that have been put in place. We've also seen, uh, for example, um, where at uh, Kim, where we are, what we tried to do was to incentivize the financial institutions to, with a slightly higher incentive so that they would provide more capital and liquidity to medium-sized uh, businesses in, in the market. Um, we have also, yeah, so, so there, th we've also seen what KCDMS is doing, is trying to leverage their grant funding so that it can combine that with commercial capital uh, to allow businesses to, to get access to additional financing. So there are things that development players can do. There are also uh, things that governments can do. The key thing is to shore up liquidity, to, to ensure that aggregate demand in the economy 
doesn't slump to such a point where businesses have no markets. Um, so so uh, these are some of the measures that, uh, that are taking place. We need to appraise though how effective they've been. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, um, a very good analysis from a macro perspective. Um, but in your view, do you think that development actors uh, need to change any specific approach to, to the way they've been doing business? Or do you think there are specific sectors that now need to, to be targeted and previously maybe were not targeted? Um, What's your view around that? Uh, just the way the, 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 the business is run, you know, for both where you are at Kim and KCDMS, would you see any changes that would, would arise from, from this? Well, I think, I think we can always pivot and um, always look for new ways to enhance uh, capital. I think one of the things that we're seeing is um, still a lot of reticence on the part of investments or they're taking much longer. Just as the gentleman said, he's asked for document after document. And you know, even though he does provide those documents at the end, I think we can engage much more with financial institutions and investors uh, to understand uh, what's going on in the market, to help them understand the risk better so that they can make informed investment decisions and support businesses in the market. Because I think the challenge is that it is taking long. Some of the investment advisors that we work with, they, they also say the same thing. Uh, they prepare investment packages for investors and the level of due diligence is now taking much longer again because of the inability to, uh, to travel. Uh, investors have moved digitally, so they're doing digital due diligence. Uh, but there's still that level of reticence or it's taking longer to get the actual capital to flow. So there is, there is a role that uh, development partners, uh, USAID and other players can play to try to, to bring more confidence in the market and help reduce the perception of risk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, well appreciated. Uh, Juliet, any any views on that, um, and especially from the, the, the points that you raised around the areas that are going to progress uh, uh, due to this COVID thing? You know, you talked about e-commerce, you talked about uh, uh, e-trading, you talked about, uh, you know, trade platforms. Um, how, would you, how would you advise uh, the, the development actors, how they should respond to some of these changes? Um, uh, do you think a lot more focus needs to be put into that because that's where the world is going to? I don't know. What, what are your views? Um, yeah, thank you. So about three, four things. Uh, there should be more focus or investment in uh, technology uh, and supporting you know, uh, partners um, or financial service providers to leverage more on technology, be it you know, in, the, in their processes, in their products, in their channels. Um, we've seen that it was much easier to scale or to pivot and support the farmers um, during the crisis for the value chain players that had already you know, embarked on that digital roadmap. Um, so there's uh, definitely it's critical to be able to support um, the partners to start investing um, in technology and being able to leverage on that. And then to just add on that, um, capacity building is critical um, because it's the only way that it can allow them now or encourage them to experiment and um, also to increase institutional uptake. Um, so, we, you know, in, when we support them and get them ready, or what we call digital readiness, then they are able to actually start uh, viewing it more as a value proposition as opposed to uh, you know, risk. Um, also supporting them in terms of assessment. So um, I'm, I, I foresee new forms of collateral, you know, a focus more on value chain data, you know, on cash flow. Um, we've been hearing issues today mentioned around how they assess the smallholder uh, farmers or the, the value chain uh, partners. So uh, I see a support area or a shift in terms of new forms of collateral and new ways uh, of 
assessment or credit assessment. And finally, just around supporting them with um, innovative risk sharing mechanisms. And I think John has talked a, a little bit about that. So I won't, you know, um, ha uh, focus too much on it, but um, I think it's a very critical area um, to just encourage, you know, the financial service providers um, to see the value proposition of um, agribusiness. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Juliet. Actually, uh, I, I share the same views, actually. I, I think the structures of collateral will change and they will have to change. Um, we need to go more into supply chain financing where, where the structure of the supply chain is what guarantees and secures the transaction. Uh, so I do agree with you. And the more that is done of technology and through technology, then the better it is going to be. And I think the financial institutions that are able to get into that, as John has put it, to pivot into that quickly, are the ones that are going to survive into the future. It's happening subtly, but within a couple of years, it will move a bit faster. And therefore, it's important that that happens. I think I have a question for you, uh, Jahazi. Uh, there's a question that has come through. So maybe we can, uh, we can throw this to you. Um, so what's the approach that uh, uh, MasterCard Foundation is currently leveraging on creating dignified jobs in agribusiness? So, you know, you, you mentioned about creating uh, dignified jobs. So exactly what is MSF doing in that uh, amidst uh, this COVID situation? And how do you think that will affect the financing aspects of, of this? Anyway. Yeah, thank you, Eric, and, and thank you, Osano, for that question, Nelson Osano, for that question. I think maybe two or three things. Uh, top on the list is we are very bold in that as, as MasterCard Foundation, we have a target of 70%, um, you know, of our target being women or young women. That's a bold move. And in every, in every intervention we go to, we want to make sure that we are reaching 70% women. So that we are deliberate in reducing all these barriers, especially gender-based bar barriers and how they affect um, the livelihoods of the young people. So we think that's important. Secondly, is that um, we've invested a lot of in the diagnostic um, between last year and, and, and today, and we are going we are going through that process. So we are actually reevaluating um, our strategy and our assumptions so that we can be alive to the facts that are happening on the ground. That's a very important uh, approach. Um, the other thing is we are a listening co-creation foundation. We are a listening foundation. We listen and then co-creation. We, 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 we we're investing a lot of our time in making sure that when we are coming up with a new intervention with partners and, and young people is that we co-create together. If we are writing a concept or a proposal, we actually come around the table and develop it together. And like asking for a full, like, you know, 200 proposal that that just comes on your desk and you start reading. For us, we are doing it the other way around. We want to co-create with the stakeholders on the ground. Um, then finally, what, what I said is the issue of inclusivity. We, we want to make sure that the young people, because we care so much about young people and how the unemployment issues and everything else you said is affecting them, that they are part and parcel of the process. We see them not just as stakeholders, but we see them as shareholders in our work. And that's powerful. Digital economy, is, is, a, is, is a huge approach and we are seeing digital economy as, as an enabler. If you listen to the story of the Agrovet, um, to, you know, to spin off, um, they started selling online. Vivian has actually elaborated how they, they had the digital platform had enabled her to remain resilient during this period of the, of the COVID. So digital economy has power. You know, there's a lot of untapped power inside there. One, because young people will get excited. Secondly, because when you think about when you think about value chain and primary agriculture, as Juliet has said, a lot of young people, because of, of how uh, intense primary agriculture can be, uh, capital intensive it can be, then we, we will see a lot of smallholder farmers, a lot of young, young people going into the opportunities within the value chain. And if, and if they have digital solutions, if, if we give them skills on how to you know, to, to adopt digital as an enabler for whatever business they are doing, then I'm sure we'll be able to leverage a lot. So, and then finally, on the supply side, we are cracking our heads, to be honest. We are cracking our heads to ask ourselves how, 
yes, young people have been termed as high risk, you know, uh, because of maybe they don't keep records consistently, they have low incomes, you know, uh, because of the nature of their business. Others are more focused on subsistence farming other than commercial farming. There are all those reasons and they are valid reasons. So we also want to make sure that we can support our supply side so that one day we can invest in research. I think we need to know more than we know today. Then finally, Eric, um, finally, Eric is to see how do we risk lending to young people? Um, I think that would be a game changer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, I appreciate that. Yeah, the risk is really, uh, I agree with you. It's going to be a game changer in this part of the world. We do need that because risk, as you've heard, everyone talks about risk. Uh, agriculture is risky and, and, and all these things that, that we talk about. But in closing, and, and this is just my, my two cents view around, around this. If, if people look at the population growth that is, that is currently happening, um, we really do need to do something about access to financing. There's been a lot of effort that has been put in production, but in my view, a lot more of markets and financing needs to be looked at because that's actually what drives production. If people are making money, then the production issues will be sorted logically. So if you have to produce food because people have to eat and the channels to get that food to the market have been sorted, then the farmer will have to look for a way to produce good quality. So I think for a long time we focused on production. I think it's about time we now move and KCDMS and uh, Kim in this case are actually doing just that uh, so that we can deal with the, with the demand side for this agriculture produce and then it sorts out the issue. Now, in closing, I know we've had a lot of questions coming through, but uh, because of time, again, we may not be able to look at all of them, but we'll send them to the panelists here. And I think mine is to thank John, Juliet and David for, for the time that they have given in this conversation. It's been a very stimulating uh, conversation and we should be having a lot more of this. And to also thank KCDMS and uh, MSC for uh, setting this up and uh, bringing it to fruition. The more we have these conversations, the more people understand how to deal with financing and the hurdles that one needs to go through to achieve the financing. Uh, I think I'll move this now to Doreen. Um, Doreen, please uh, pick it up. I think we have one more clip to look at and yes. then we move from there. Thank you, Doreen. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you, our panelists, for the conversation. So as we always say, in every crisis, there's a bit of a silver lining. So. Um, I'll bring for you a small story that uh, we can see from one of the financiers on how uh, they've actually grown their portfolio during this uh, crisis. And he goes on to just give us a few snippets of how, of why their portfolio grew there. So just two minutes of this, and then we can continue. And then this is Mohamed Malia, uh, Chief Credit Officer at FC. FC is currently the single largest uh, culprit of agricultural credit to the sector, the financial sector. Uh, speaking about the effects of COVID-19 to the portfolio, you would be amazed that uh, there would be an expectation that the effect would be negative. Contrary to that, the effects have been very positive for us. It happened that by the time the shocks were coming in, these enterprises were not ready for uh, installment repayments. When the disruptions were happening in the markets, these enterprises were still not faced with that disruption because it was actually dependent on the project-specific nature of those enterprises. The other thing that we noticed is that most of the people who are like you and me, who are actually dependent on an eight to five job, now went back and invested their time into the small shoppers that they had in Gong, into the small shoppers they had in Kisenia, into the small shoppers that they had back in the village because formal employment was not meaningful. This population actually noticed that there was actually an investment in agriculture. And this is what was now beginning to drive the surge in the portfolio that you were having. Because for once, these enterprises that were neglected previously became actually an opportunity 
this structuring of the portfolio to match with the specifics of the enterprises became actually a good fallback. So thank you, a good story there. Uh, in the midst of uh, all the crisis, we can see at least some of the positive um, things that were observed um, from, our, from, uh, from one of the financiers. So without much further ado, uh, I will just like to call on uh, Dr. Robert Mwadime. He's a USA KCDMS chief of party to give us some closing remarks. Welcome Dr. Mwadime. All right, I hope you can see me. I'm uh, currently seated on my boss's table. <laughs> I'm actually at USID at uh, my boss's table. He accommodated me because I was here for another meeting. And I just want to congratulate all of us. Uh, this has been wonderful. We've just been discussing here with Harry Gunn of the quality of discussions that we've had this afternoon and how practical these discussions have been. Uh, we've learned a lot, and I believe that uh, the different groups, whether it's the supply side or the demand side, we've been able to collect some things that uh, we can actually put into our workspace. I think one of the learnings that I have uh, got this afternoon is that uh, we just have to be innovative. We just have to know that when there's such kind of shocks, the best way to deal with them is to be innovative, is to use more data for our decision making, is to use more technology in the way we do business, is for us, of course, to be more uh, flexible, uh, to be able to meet the needs either of the customer or the needs of the supplier. So we, we wanted to take this opportunity to be able to summarize everything that we have received today and put it together in a way that we can share with the most of you. So it will either be a compendium of some of these uh, things that we've had today. Uh, my team is planning to summarize some of them and be able to share widely with at least most of the participants who have come today. Like we have also said, uh, Eric has put it, this kind of discussion is actually very timely. Of course, in future, we need to think how to address some of the political economy aspects of all this. I didn't hear us discussing whether in such shocks, corruption increased or people are more marginalized or if there were uh, cases where, of Cause there was collusion to exploit other people even much more. But those are the kind of discussions for us who are in development would like to see how do we invest so that at least those kind of things are addressed. But I like the discussions on the raising the voices of those kind of people, the marginalized the voices of the businesses and bringing them forward when there is such kind of a shock and being able uh, to invest, to make sure at least the voices of the business people, the voices of the private sector are heard in this kind of dialogue. Otherwise, I'm very grateful. I want to congratulate Eric specifically and the team for just organizing this together with the KCDMS team and being able to bring out the issue a lot at this particular time. Others, congratulations, everybody very high level uh, quality of discussions. This depicts the kind of people we are in Kenya and moving forward, we should have more of this. So I want to invite uh, Harrigan, uh, who is our uh, AOR here at USID, just to say one or two words. And then of course we close this. We want to apologize that we came late. We were in another meeting and it took just slightly longer than we thought. Thank you very much. Harigan Karina. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. Good evening, colleagues. It's my pleasure meeting all of you. My name is Harigan Mohong. I work here at USID, um, partly covering the Kenya Crops and Dairy Market System Project. 
uh, or activity as we call them here. I don't want to waste a lot of your time. I think Robert has said very nice things. Um, on, the, on the call, I see many people that I, I know, you know, a lot of interactions in life. Uh, the conversations I have learned personally, and um, I just think that there is room for us to continue getting better. Just like one of the things that I do is to keep this cup here, uh, that every day is a chance to get better. That's one. And the other, my quote for the week is this one here. Without chaos, nothing can evolve. So within COVID, I think we've seen so many things happening and uh, you guys are really responsive to that. I think the banking sector and finance has been one of the most resilient, uh, just, just like our AFC colleague has, has indicated. I think the banking sector retained their staff in by and large. And, and, and I even saw somewhere where the banking sector even increased salaries. Um, so they got the money from, uh, from the private sector, and which is a good thing. Uh, basically, what USID is trying to do is to empower Kenyans to do their, their own thing. Uh, not all of us the best as we remain safe and I hope to connect with all of you at some point in the physical. Thank you and have a good evening. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for those uh, wonderful closing remarks. Um, I will not add anything more to this because I believe uh, we've been, they've all been captured. Uh, the conversations have been in, uh, very insightful and this conversation actually has been very timely and uh, our hope is that as we move forward, we'll be able to implement some of the insights that have been captured out of this conversation. Now, mine is to thank you right now for joining us and to mention that, uh, as Eric mentioned, we are aware we did not answer quite, quite a bit of the questions and we will have these ones forwarded to our panelists for their input. Also to mention, uh, we will share a recording of this session in the course of this week so that you can have this for your future reference. And with that, allow me to bring this webinar to a close have a great evening, morning, or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you very much.